Well, we're seeing dark clouds once again descending on US regional banks as US and global rates traders overlook what the Fed have got to say and price an additional rate cuts for 2023 and onto 2024 as well. We've seen gold futures trade to new all-time highs and we preview the ECB meeting and the non-farm payrolls number. It's time to get in front of the charts. This is The Trade-Off. Well, hi there. I'm Chris Weston from Pepperstone. I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. And we are going to be navigating. We are going to be going through the different charts on our radars, the different landmines that we're focused on, uh, and the different key thematics that are driving price action, and, and ultimately looking at the probability uh, within certain trades that we like at the moment. Mr. Blake Morrow, come into the program, if you will. Hey, Chris. Good to see you. Good to see you, mate. Good to see you. Look, cross currents going forward. I mean, yeah, we can talk about the VIX being still at 18%, but yeah, we're seeing regional banks being chopped up. We've seen PacWest. I hope you're not a banker of those guys or banking with those guys at the moment. Although I think depositors are going to be very, very safe, as we know. But certainly bank equity has been carved up after market uh, and everyone's focused on the banks again and what this means for, for, for interest rates as well. So there's a lot going on. I mean, it's, it's difficult to say when you're seeing the VIX at 18% and you know, short-term volatility reads in FX markets still pretty sanguine. Queen, um, but we're seeing some good flows and some good good you know, range expansion playing through and, and good trading opportunities. At least I'm seeing that on the radar at the moment. We are. And, you know, it's coming right off the Fed and the FOMC today, which is a historic meeting of all proportions. I'm just kidding about that. But, but you know, <laughs> it, could be. It, Fed, could be. it could be. It could be in some it ways. Could be. It, could be. it could be. Yeah. I, I You know, I'm not going to argue that point, actually. Um, but you're right. There are a lot of cross currents. And I, and I think that the, the panic really started to set in late in the day in North American session. So, you know, a lot of you are waking up to a lot of volatility. And we're going to talk all about that here um, over the course of the next 30 or 45 minutes, we right? Are, mate. We are, mate. And yeah, right. banks are at the heart of that as well. I think it's historic from a Fed perspective because we've had such an aggressive hiking cycle and it's pretty clear now that we're going on a pausing cycle. They've kept the door open. But it's the banks that really capsulate my mind at the moment anyway. So let's get to it. Let's go into Topical Thunder. So let's go into the banks, Blake, because obviously that's top, that's front of mind. Because once Jerome Powell uh, stepped down from their mic, uh, that's when things started to to get a bit lively. Um, I actually thought that he he at the time I thought he he handled the situation pretty well. To be honest, I think his communication was was good. He didn't really upset anyone. He led to consensus. Um, yeah, we didn't really get much signal from what he was saying. But it was afterwards, maybe the. Yeah, we saw the bank ETF, the KRE ETF, really starting to crack, and that's where you know we saw two yields, two year yields, you know, sort of closing, or moving fifteen points to the low. We saw yeah, buyers of yen, gold started moving to the highs, and maybe that 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 the bank equity investors wanted more of a sort of a metaphorical hug and saying, you know, recognise the the ills that are brewing up in the system, and he still thought that thinks that the financial, the banking system is is fundamentally sound. Of course, after market, then we got PacWest coming out and saying that looking at strategic reviews and potentially. Uh, potentially sales. The stock was down over 50% in the aftermarket. Um, and maybe the you know, KRE investors who everyone's short selling the absolute bejesus out of that market at the moment. I'm a massive fan of short selling. We know that central banks generally are as well. But we are seeing, in my opinion, a speculative attack taking place on finan on US financials, especially in the regionals. They're going after small caps, at the, the weakest links at the moment. And you, know, you can't avoid a bank run. I know depositors are safe. But when depositors are looking at bank equity that's getting absolutely carved up at the moment, they're saying to themselves, do I want to be in bank in these deposits or do I want to just you know, take it into money market funds? Do I want to put it in repo? That's the issue that you've got at the moment. So depositors are safe. But when you're seeing bank equity getting carved up and everyone's going after for all these banks at the moment, the interest rate uh, cuts are being priced in as we see bank equity go down. Gold to hedge against what we're seeing there, and and yeah, you know, we're still yet to see the the review on on the senior loan uh, lending review from the Fed, which is going to show that these banks' lending stands are going up. So banks, very much for me, right at the heart of driving matters. You're not stepping in front of these banks. It's a loaded question, actually, Blake, but you're not stepping in front of these banks at the moment. No, no, there's no way. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of people that are pulling out money out of the out of these regional banks. They're putting them in to like uh, Apple Bank, which is paying 5% interest, you know, in a money market account. My wife is even talking about it. So, I mean, you have situations like that where they're going right. They're taking, you're, you're going right to the bank that's the, the local bank down the street, 
pulling all your money out, putting it in a money market account in some bigger banking institution. You know, and I think it was right when um, when when Fed Chair Powell uh, said, you know, he does they don't have the Fed doesn't have any uh, cuts in their forecasts. And and I think the market's got a little wobbly. In their forecast. In their in forecast. Their forecast. Yeah. The You're market's right. got a slightly different situation. Their forecasts have been wrong so many times. We, yeah, the, the the rates market's not buying it, right? No, it's not. And and then, you know, I was I was looking around and just to see some of these regional banks, because the, the, the bank that came up on, on everybody's radar is PacWest. But if you look around at some of these regional banks, I want to give you a list of just a few, Chris, that are that are down over 10 percent today. You have uh, SHF Holdings. You have Pathfinder Bank Corp, Re Republic First Bank Corp, which is not First Republic. It's people probably just got the words mixed up and they decided to short that one. And then you got Old Point Financial Corporation. Those are down from 10 to 18 uh, percent. And then there's a bunch of regional banks that were down seven, eight, nine percent as well. So the whole it feels like something's going, you're looking for a circuit breaker depositors are obviously yeah protected uh, under the explicit uh, implicit guidance but i'll tell you one thing before we go and, and my producer starts giving me some uh, giving me the old wind up signal bloody producer um rate markets the fed can come out and say we're not going to raise rates under our forecast under our base case but we work on a bimodal kind of distribution and we work on the fact that the rates market saying We've got 84 basis points of cuts being priced in, so you know, just over three for this year. Um, and in, if you go take the, the SOFA futures, interest rate tradable futures, between the, the second half of this year, starting second half, into December, I've got 231 basis points of cuts being priced in between that period. If you take that in isolation, I, I think that's the largest degree of rate cuts which are being priced in over a period in 37 years. The market's not buying what the Fed are selling here. The market expects at some stage to see an aggressive rate cutting cycle. That that's that's all we're saying. Why why is gold doing what it's doing? Because of that right there. Why is Bitcoin doing why it's doing? Well, Bitcoin I mean, probably should be higher because yeah, and we'll talk about that in a second. Let's move yeah, on. yeah. We, we we can get on all that. But you know, let's go into the next topic. Let's talk about what's happening tomorrow morning, the European Central Bank meeting. And uh, you know, I Look, I, I'm a I'm a fan of euros. I'm long euros. I, I was long euros a couple of weeks ago with the Euro Aussie Euro Euro Kiwi. I reloaded back long those over the last couple of days. I'm still buying euros. And look at the euro dollar. It's sitting right up against you know highs uh, around the 111 level. If it starts getting above 112, there's like 112, 112, 20 is a big, big. Fibonacci big retracement on a weekly well, it's chart. Been, it's been stuck in that one one eleven one oh nine range for a couple of weeks, and yet you, you're thinking that thinking this breaks out to the top side. Well, at least well here here's the thing, Chris, and this is the one thing that I've learned one one thing I've learned many things trading over the last twenty five years. But one of the things that I've learned is when you get something moving in one direction, then it stops and doesn't pull back, and then you have people like me saying, "Oh yeah, I'd buy a Euro at parity. Yeah, I'd buy a Euro even at one oh five." And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I'm like, I think I'm just going to buy the euro. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, the, give up. the pullbacks are so shallow. It's not getting anybody a time to cover their shorts. It's not giving any 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 time for anybody to get in either. So you're going to start getting that FOMO above the highs. If we have an ECB that raises by a quarter, as expected, but also opens the door for further rate hikes, which... I think the market, you know, you, you could probably give me more concrete data here. I mean, we're looking at at least another quarter. Some people believe even another half a, you know, half a point or 50 basis points, yeah. you know, uh, after tomorrow. So well, let me let me put you, you know, let me put your ease there, go, Blake. Um, go ahead. So, go ahead. yeah, we're pricing 29 basis points of, of hikes for this meeting um, tomorrow morning for you. There are other places in the world other than America. So this will be um, afternoon for me. Um so 29 basis points, that, that, that means we're, we're discounting four basis points for 50, really. So, yeah, a small premium that we may get at 50 basis points, which probably is fair. Um, so, yeah, don't buy euros. I, I wouldn't buy euros just because we're going to get a 25 basis point price. It's, it's, it's all in the price. Where we go into the in, into the rates curve and look out further, which I think is the most important thing, is is will the statement marry up with with what's being priced? And that's where you could get gyrations in, in, in buns and, and obviously in the euro. So we're pricing 364 by mid uh, going into Q3. So the current um, you know, sort of market rate that, that, that they bench this market is 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 2.9%, 2 290 basis points. So effectively, you've got 74 basis points or three rate hikes which are being priced into the swaps market between now 
and uh, yeah, Q3 of this year. So that's what you're looking for. Yeah, we're looking at the tone of the statement. We're listening to Christine Lagarde if we can put ourselves through it. Um, and, and, and hearing the tone of voice, are they going to be hawkish? We expect, the market expects her to be hawkish. So therefore, if she gives any indication that they're, that they're reaching an end point, a pause perhaps, which we don't expect, the euro is going to have a big move down. But we're not expecting that. So what we're doing is we're looking at the tone of the statement, listen to everything they're saying, the projections, every one of these factors, and we're saying, yeah, will we see these 74 basis points realised? The other factor which I think we really need to look out for is... In late June, Blake, I'm sure you probably know this, but in late June, that there's these, these targeted long-term refinancing operations, the, tel the Teltros, which are needing to be repaid. There's over over half a half a half a billion dollars, half a trillion dollars of, of of these loans, which need to be given back by by European banks back to the ECB. That's a massive wall of liquidity that needs to leave the European banking sector. So. People are quite concerned about how that goes, but they are expecting the ECB to give these banks like bridging loans to effectively ease that 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 fiscal burden. Uh, if we don't hear anything about that, then European banks could get carved up pretty badly. So there's a lot of money that needs to come off these balance sheets back to the ECB in late June. That 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 is a, a significant headwind to bank equity, um, but they'll need to work out a way of appeasing that situation. So that's something I'm exploring as well. Uh, factor oh. there. Blake, I'm going to go I, to the debt ceiling. Like, we've been talking yep. about this one. We put, sorry, I'm going to give you a chance to answer. That's rude of me. Go on. No, I just want to say I'm looking at definitely the the uh, the deep olive tan indicator tomorrow. I, you know, <laughs> deeper, the, deeper the more hawkish we're going to get. You know, the just opposite, the darker the opposite, the, tan the, opposite, the, the opposite of Michael Brown. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, Michael, that came from him. Him. Oh, he, loves, he loves Christine Lagarde. <laughs> anyway, that debt ceiling. I want to talk about debt ceiling because we have new news. We have new news. We were waiting for it last week and it's going to be deafening, Blake. It's going to be way more deafening for you living in America, of course. So the way I'm seeing this now is that, that um, Janet Yellen, the US Secretary, Tre US Secretary Treasury, has given us a, a, like an informal date, a loose date effectively for the debt ceiling X date, the drop date, when they've exhausted their all, all their exaudinary measures. And that's going to be the first June, early June. The problem with that date, that, that date, uh, which is fair because you know they've got about what 285 billion dollars of cash sitting on the Fed's balance sheet at the moment under the tre Treasury General account. Is 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 the rate at which that's falling means that by the first of June they get to about 25 to 30 billion US dollars. That's where they you know shit gets real in that situation. But what makes this a bit more complicated? There's two things that make this more a bit more complicated. Uh, in in mid June they will be getting a, a ton of of corporate tax. 50 billion or so, which which will give, keep them funded a little bit longer, which makes that X date probably somewhere more July, the hard X date that is. And then at the end of the end of the month, we also get a maturity uh, for one of the big pension funds, which will give them an extra 150 billion dollars. So that means that it's not as easy as just you know, their cash balance will draw down. They're going to get some more money in, and I think probably the hard X date, which we'll probably know, um, you know in a week or two's time, the X, the finite X date will, will probably be. Um, in July. But that 1st of June date is, is in, in play now. Now, the problem, of course, is that the House are currently in recess. They'll go on recess again for another week on the 26th. We've got the Senate, which are going to be going into recess soon. So really, there's just two weeks when they're actually together when they can get a deal done. So it makes life a bit it's problematic to do. So they're the dynamics that I'm seeing. And I, I do think we're going to get big volatility around it, though. Yeah, I mean, there's 12 legislative days between 12. now and then, and we're we're look we're literally looking at the 9th exactly of May to the 18th of May is the is the window we need to get a deal. There's not going to be a deal, is there? There's not going to be a deal. No, there isn't. There, there, no, one, I mean, Democrats want to just push out the date, and Republicans are holding fast with saying, "Hey, we need to push through their agenda or an agenda before we actually, you know, uh, agree to this." And so it's the Senate. The Senate's like. Yeah, everything you're pushing through the house is dead on arrival anyway. So it's it's going to get ugly. And you know what? I, I still believe that the yen is going to be the place to be. I was the so, yen. yen. Go back and look at the 2011 playbook. And in that week, the, the week leading up to it, Aussie yen was the, was the play. So yen at the moment, yeah, it's starting to find a bid, short covering probably. Um, but that was the play in 2011. I expect it to be the play this time around. Gold did very well as well in 2011. But that was rallying into it. Pretty much like you're seeing at the moment, to be honest. Nope, with that, for just like reasons. it is now. But right. we've got to time it. It's, it's, it's not until we actually know a firm date, which we've got a loose date at the moment, which seems okay. But until we actually get a fine X date, 
when the date is when they're going to have to start cutting back on essential payments to Medicare, Medicaid, to veterans, veterans to yep. Social Security. Although I think that's going to be a priority because you take away um, Social Security from 58, Ameri- 58 million Americans, you lose a few votes, don't you, at the end of the day. So, And then obviously the, the elephant in the room, which of course is, you know, the the... The, the, the ability to pay bond you know, coupons and, and, and debt obligations, which will never happen, but if it was to, then obviously, which we heard from Powell last night, is a big thing. So look, the bottom line is, 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 is we're starting to get these dates now. It will, in my opinion, I think it's going to be a volatility event and I think it's going to be deafening. So we are doing our homework on that right now and trying to work out you know, what are the trades to put on. So you're a yen, I'm a yen, I think, and, and a gold. I think that's going to be the play of the day there. And, and guess what? It's going to be deafening here at the trade-off because, and, and for good reason. Sorry, just, everyone just, hates just, talking about the debt ceiling. It's like one of those things that you just, oh God, it's back again, it's back again. I've just got to talk <laughs> about it. And it's like, you know how it's, you know it's going to get resolved. But you just ask what if and, and, and when it will be. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those real painful moments we have to sort of encompass every two years. It really is. And, you know, another painful moment that we get once a month is the jobs report. We got the non-farm payroll coming up on Friday. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about it because, you know, we're, we're, this will be the 12th. Well, we had 12 consecutive months of beats. And then this month, are we in, due for the same there, Chris? And here, here's the thing. I You know, when... I don't like to to do you know talk about trading as gambling, but when I when I walk by like a a, a, a roulette table and I see it's been hitting red, 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 I automatically just sit there and go, it's going to be black, it's going to be black at some point, and it just keeps going red. Here's the thing, I don't know if this is the month that we're going to start to see us miss on jobs. We just had the ADP number came out spectacularly strong. I know it's just the ADP, but we also had some ISM data that came in. Um, Chris, I, I want to get your feeling on how you see this jobs report. I've been asking people, you know, everybody that I've been talking to about how they feel about the U.S. labor market. It, it it's still really strong, and it's kind of a, the form. the jobs report was a little bit weak, wasn't it? But you know, the job openings have, have, have continued to yeah, thrive. jolts, yeah, yeah. But a question for the audience out there. Do you think trading's gambling? I think it's a great question. You know, we don't. no one knows the future. If you did, it'd be insider trading. No one knows the future, but you can manage your risk. Is trading gambling? Leave your thoughts there, because I'll go and Blake and I will debate this one next week in one of the segments, because it's that actually a subject. Good. It's a subject that's actually pretty close to my heart. We get this all the time. So yeah, leave your comments there. We don't know the future. I'm not trying to skew the, uh, skew the outcome there. But what do I think on payrolls? Yeah, you're right. We've had 12 in a row. We've had 12 beats in a row uh, in terms of the actual uh, the level of job creation on the on the on the um, the establishment survey. Um, but actually, if you look in the, the US dollar and the dollar index in, in the five minutes after we've got those 12 beats, it's been up eight of the 12 times. So it's no guarantee that you're going to get, you know, I know five minutes is a long time after news these days. It's, you know, we, we work in split seconds ticks. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, yeah, the, the, there's no guarantee that we get these big beats on, on the payrolls number and the, and the dollar continues to rally. But we have the form guide is, is suggestive that, that we continue to do so. Um, I think the average hourly earnings is, is really, really, really important. Um, and the market's looking for that to be unchanged at 4.2%. I think the unemployment rate is really, really important at 3.6% expected. Um, but, I mean, let's take it really simplistically. You know, we're never going to get a situation where the unemployment rate, uh, so the, the, the level of job creations misses the downside. We see a higher unemployment rate and we see a weaker wage numbers and then everyone goes, oh, we're going to sell dollars. You know, you're going to see, you know, permutations of that. But I think sure. from a really simplistic perspective, the, the Fed want to see a cooling of the labour market. And if we have a look at the, the three and six month um, you know, average of, of payrolls, you know, it's well over, it's into sort of 350,000. So if we were to get the, the median estimate 180,000, that represents a cooling of the labour market. It's still a good number, but we are seeing cooling of the labour market. And maybe that's enough to appease US dollar shorts. Faults? Oh, you know, I... Yeah. Thoughts as time's up. No, you know, the, the thing is, uh, Chris, is I, I still expect the labor market to be strong. But uh, with the looming debt debt ceiling debate coming up, any strength in the dollar, especially if it's against the yen, I'm going to be fading into it. Uh, yeah. I'd love to I'd love to see a spike up in the dollar yen at this yeah. point on a Friday. Would so. you? Yeah. OK, we can talk about that one. Simple playbook. 
Yeah, I yep. expect I expect risk to take a bit of a uh, to take a bit of positive. Let's obviously see how banks are trading as well. But yeah, I think below one hundred below one hundred and fifty thousand, I think that would be a very positive situation for for risk. I think the dollar comes under, we see front end yields lower. I think if you get a yeah two sixty two seventy and above, that would probably be a negative for markets. To see what happens with the unemployment rate there. Anyway, let's go into the charts that matter. Let's go to that's a setup. <laughs> I'm stepping up first. I want to bring up gold, Mr. Blake Morrow. Gold's been all the talk of the town. We've just seen a new all-time high in gold futures. You can see that our price here, uh, which is priced off the gold futures, and we, we sort of bring it back for a cash price, uh, has also broken out to an all-time high. We've seen sellers. They said, what happened with gold futures? We did see uh, a spike up just on that twilight session, just between the rollover of the US close into the Asian trading session. Obviously, liquidity is a factor. We got up to 2085 in, in futures, and it's come back down, settled at uh, you know, 20, 30 bucks lower from that point. So someone's come in, hit the bid, bang, up it goes, and... and um, yeah, it's come back down a little bit. So it's a real trade, but we've seen a new all-time high in our in our in our gold market. You know, that should you know, spot gold market hasn't hasn't got that high yet, but gold futures have, and of course that's what we trade. You can't really trade gold uh, spot gold. It's a, it's a physical entity, but you know, you quote you trade gold futures, and, and that's what our uh, XAU USD price is traded off. Um, I actually look at gold uh, as a hedge against what's happening in interest rates. So interest rate cuts are being priced in. People are worried about this this credit crunch which is coming, tighter lending standards. We're going to see a mild recession as the Fed would call it, or staff, staff projections anyway. Um, and you know we're seeing gold as, a, as working its best days in, in that environment, slower growth, you know, rate cuts being priced in. Um, but I don't think gold's overloved. You know, positioning in managed money is not you know, top percentile. You know, risk reversals aren't particularly high. It's obviously had a big move. You could say that could be overbought, but I don't think you know. There's internals that say this is overbought, overloved. How are you? What are you thinking? Where's the probability here, Blake? Oh, I, I still, I, I love how it's just paused. Uh, it's just pausing right at the highs. It just seems like it's inevitable that we're going to break into new highs. Everything that I look at that that trades inversely or, or or conversely to gold, it seems to be moving in the same way. Whether it's rates or whether it's the yen. Uh, the, you know, with the yen strengthening, I would expect gold to continue to move higher. Um, you know, we're coming up to those all-time highs. Look, you know, this might be a classic case of FOMO. You know, we, we yeah, I know where I'm wrong, and I know it's below 1950, but a break above those uh, those recent highs, and we start surging a new all-time highs. I mean, what's really going to stop the bum rush? Especially, I'll tell you what's going to stop the bum rush. It's going to be the KRE ETF. If we were to see the KRE ETF reverse and and reverse hard for whatever reason, I can't tell you the reason right now. Um, but maybe some shorts cover. Maybe someone comes in and says the world's good. You know, banks are solved. Get involved, kind of thing. Um, I think if the KRE was to move higher, then I think then gold price would come under a bit of pressure. But for now, have you seen the chart of the KRE ETF? It looks dark it as is. anything. It is. I don't, you know, and it's hard to hard to believe that banks are really going to all go nowhere or lower. But we'll see. Uh, you know, the chart I'm going to bring up for that's a setup for my first setup is going to be the dollar index, Chris. Now I know the dollar index, and and I like to always, you know, preface this: not one size shoe fits all feet. So you know, we're dealing with saying? the dollar. Is that, is that a proper well, saying? No, maybe, maybe it goes something like that. But remember, it's late in the day, and I've been up <laughs> since three in the morning. So, and it's yeah, late in the yeah. afternoon, almost in the evening for me. Anyway, the not one size fits all. There we go. All right. Uh, but when you're talking about the dollar index, and you're talking about the euro and the on the cusp of the ECB meeting. Um, you know, a, a breakdown below the 1.0085 level or 80 level should take us to the 127% extension. I know there's a lot of lurkers down there that want to be a buyer of the dollar index as we approach 100, but uh, the the uh, FIB extension, the 127% FIB extension comes in right around 99.67. And I think that's going to be a, a, a logical target. Now, remember, uh, a lot of people have been trying to play the dollar to the long side at these levels. So a breakdown should give us at least some fresh momentum, even if it's just for a day or two. Even if the ECB, the the the, the it just lasts for a day and then we go completely risk off, people turn around, start buying the dollar again. It's entirely possible. So I wouldn't get too carried away being aggressively short the dollar. But anyway, there's the dollar index. We're approaching these lows. Yeah. What are your thoughts here on the dollar index? All right. KRE, okay, coming back to this, <laughs> it's literally at the center of my world at the moment. And, you know, so much so much money's been invested in the US in its capital markets for so long. But, yeah, the problems that we're seeing now are, are, are starting in, in the US, you know, the banking space. If this gets legs, 
and we see more bank failings, consolidations. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm not, I don't want to be, the, but I'm just watching the price action here, and it's telling me that, that that something's happening. And maybe that's just because there's a speculative short attack that needs to be addressed. Um, but you know, you if if the KRE continues to go down, we see further rate cuts being priced in the US. You know, it just disincentivizes people to be in US assets, um, and, and it breaks the downside is the bottom line in that situation there. So. The one thing that I, I would really like to get short on the US dollar is a steeper curve. I know people sort of associate steeper curves with, um, uh, with, with, with dollar strength, but if we're going to see it because the front end's moving down not and not seeing too much of the long end, I think that would be a big dollar negative, uh, and that would see us trade to the bottom of the end of that channel. So which way do I see this going? I'll probably see it going down. Payrolls could affect that because, yeah, at the end of the day, look, we've, we've all started getting really bearish on, on the US and because of the banks and bits and pieces. But look at what happens, Blake. Let's say hypothetically we've got nothing priced for June. We've got 84 basis points of cuts being priced for for this year. Imagine we get a blowout payrolls number. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's it's a possibility. Next week we've got sure. CPI. I and mean, let's say we get a hotter CPI number. The world goes, oh, this isn't part of the scene. This isn't part of what we're, we're, we're programming and pricing. The world gets a muddied picture. We start buying dollars then. So how does that work out? Uh, you know, catch everybody on the short side, you know, on a breakdown. It's going to be the case, and that's, isn't it? That could be the case. I think it's a good setup. That's a setup, hey. Chris. That's a setup. Boom, 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 boom. Hey. But that's what we do as trading, right? So we're saying to ourselves, what is the vision of the market? The vision of the market is that that we yeah, we're taking a slightly shy approach because we got this this slower growth in the US, mold recession, rates are cut, rate cuts are coming at some stage, we just need to know the trigger. But what if they don't? That's where the pain trade kicks in and we start buying, seeing dollar shorts taking profits. Anyway, let's go to dollar yen. Let's have a look at what we're seeing there. So we're going to bring up the chart there. We've got that. It's funny how the level was, it's it's, it's a coincidence, isn't it, Blake? We got right back over to that, that 137.60.50 sort of level and, and, and the yen started finding buyers because of the banks. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Obviously, the the... the it's the banks. Banks doesn't don't look at dollar yen. It's the you know, dollar yen is a function of what's happening in in rates pricing and the need to hedge that that risk by buying yen and covering those shorts that we've been seeing. But it's where we got right into the level and then everyone started selling dollar yen and 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 fading dollars against the yen specifically. So, what were you doing? How do we play this now? Do you, do you stay short or would would, we, would you initiate shorts into this position? Look for a for a move back into say the one thirty two level. How are you how are you thinking? Well, first of all, let me let me just say it was my play of the day last week. I was playing short dollar yen into the BOJ. And guess what? I got caught wrong footed. I got stopped out. I did take a loss. Um, and it took me a couple of days to get back on the saddle. And then I turned around and shorted the dollar yen yesterday. I'm short Aussie yen right now and Kiwi yen. So I'm actually already shorting those and have been for the last couple of days. So I'm already playing the yen back to the long side as planned last week. You know, and I've, I've I've been on the comeback trail since last week, but I still believe, Chris, that the dollar yen or the yen in general is the place you want to be in a banking crisis, in a risk off type of environment, in a debt ceiling debate that's going to seem like that's it's not never for a ending. Couple, that's not for a month or so, and timing that's going to be. It's going to be for the next. There's a month. lot of there's a lot of water to flow into. I just want to quickly pull you up on one thing. I'm sure there's a few people in the in in, in the viewers who who are probably going to ask this question. You're short Aussie yen and you're short Kiwi yen. Like why don't why don't just you're doubling up on your position because of the correlation. I know Kiwis are slightly faster beta market there, but yeah, you know, when you were going through that, you might you, obviously you probably traded at different times. But why? How are you thinking about that doubling of the position size? Because effectively those correlations on that. I well, I always keep that in 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 uh, in whenever I'm moving my money into yen and it's in a multiple currencies. It could be against the euro yen or the Aussie yen or the Kiwi yen or whatever. But the New Zealand yen was following that that New Zealand jobs report yeah, yesterday, right. yeah, yeah. so I sold that spike. I mean, yeah, okay. I, I, yeah. that's that was that was the that was the linchpin for me. It's like you know, it it, it did it during the uh, RBNZ the uh, well, a few weeks ago. I I'm late in the day. I've had about six beers. I'm ready to go ahead and fade some stuff. I'm joking, joking, <laughs> joking. Not crying out loud, people, get off the comment section. All right, let's. <laughs> Chris, beer and trading don't have a play. Well. Wow. No, they don't. They don't play well. You know, I'm going to actually take us into the Nikkei and we're going to just change the subject. Um, you know what's interesting about the Nikkei, Chris? It, it, it's definitely correlated to the yen. So, you know, and, and to the dollar yen for that matter, you can just you can say it's correlated that way. Um, there was all of these reports and I just remember two days ago, 
uh, records, record amount of money coming into Nikkei, you know, hedge funds and institutions and yada, yada, yada. And I, I remember looking at the Nikkei and I'm like, huh, it's testing the highs. Huh. It's trying to break out. And then I look back, you know, the next day and we got a failed breakout yesterday. I love failed And breakout. we've seen, yeah, and we've seen a reversal ever since. I, I actually think that the downside is not fairly limited. Is this a long-term double top setting up? I don't know. There's a lot of work that has to be done in order for this to be some long-term double top. But I will tell you, significant resistance as you approach that 29,300 level. And I, and I think it opens up some downside back to the 50 DMA, which is the orange tr moving average, or the 200 DMA, which happens to coincide with the 618 retracement just above 27,500. If for, if, at, at any rate, there is some downside here, especially if the yen continues to strengthen. What's your thought about the Nikkei? Well, I, I, I would firstly go back to you and say, go and price the Nikkei in US dollar terms rather than Japanese terms, right? And so, you know, you've got you've you've got a market that's priced in yen, and um, you know, obviously, as, as the yen's been weakening off because you've got a central bank who are you know so far removed from G10, uh, you know, it's not funny that that you've got. And, and an easy policy they're, they're doing a, a review that's going to take 12 to 18 months that i think michael <laughs> brown in his trade-off like coined it really well he could, he could do it in six seconds why do they have to yeah. take them so long so yeah kudos to michael brown for some sharp comments there um but yeah definitely um yeah i think you'd, you'd price this in a foreign currency and have a look at it that way because there's probably a massive yen effect in this that said you know it doesn't take any away from from your question um, yeah, I, I would be I would be putting sell stops on the trade, so just looking to, to ride the momentum low, just below the lows, and just hope that that momentum continues to take me in there. A lot of these times in momentum trades like that, you get chopped out, and that's why you do have you know quite poor win uh, win loss ratios. Strike rates are quite low, but when you're looking for the move lower, you're looking for to getting out the trade with a small loss and looking for a big re re reward effectively. So yeah, not. All win loss ratios are created equally. It's determined to me by strategy. Uh, I like playing, you know, short momentum, uh, short uh, short stops through that, and take it down to those levels there. Just let that that momentum drive you lower. So I think that that's an interesting one. So good chart there. Thank you for bringing it up. And it's an interesting one about thinking about foreign indices and the fact that they are priced in currencies, foreign currencies. So you know, in TradingView and, and other platforms, you you can convert it into another currency to to effectively see what that that currency exposure is into the currency of your platform as well, and and your 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 um your 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 you know uh, specific currency that you trade in there. Anyway, another one to, for another time. Let's go to play of the day. Right, I've got Sterling Aussie, and uh, yeah, despite all the love that we saw, what a crazy move from the RBA, crazy, crazy, crazy days. Crazy. Yeah, we've seen this this regression channel. Now I've actually expanded the regression channel. It's just a line of best fit, effectively. Um, you know, and and we, we've taken a two and a half standard deviation move. Uh, you know, either side of that line of best fit. So it's kind of like a an alternative, well, it's, say a different way from Bollinger Bands. It, it's a different way of looking at it effectively, but it's just using the line of best fit rather than a 20-day moving average. Um, and what we've seen is that sort of coming down is obviously the RBA surprised everyone apart from CBA and a couple of other cats. Um, and, and, but what we're seeing now is, is it's sort of reverting back to its fundamentals, um, and that is the global growth. You know, copper's breaking down pretty hard at the moment. China's equity markets, and yeah, they're, they're consolidating, but they're, they're not really outperforming at the moment. Um, and, and I think you're going to see a situation where, you know, after some fun and games, you know, we're back to a situation where rates in, in, in Australia are not pricing anything really. Uh, and we're still ex you know, expecting the, the Bank of England to, 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 to hike rates you know, next week. Um, but it's priced in, of course. But yeah, I think this, this we're back to a trade of, of looking at global growth. And, uh, you know, in a deterioration where the KRE, uh, you know, if it continues to go down, uh, I expect the Australian dollar to, to underperform other G10 currencies, as you do with your, your short Aussie yen trade there. But I expect the Aussie dollar to revert back to being that proxy of global growth following copper and all these other factors. Uh, and I see this you know, bouncing off the bottom end of this regression channel uh, and breaking back out to, to, to new highs. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quick to take the stops on this one as well. Uh, but I think this one goes higher. I, I love the I love the channel, Chris, and I love the pound Aussie long uh, as as well. Um, I, I want to take you over to my play of the day, which will be the Euro Mexican peso. And um, you know the biggest carry trade out here in G what would it be G not G ten G twenty just call G20? it a major currency. 
major currencies uh, in the in the FX market. One of the biggest carries is going to be the Mexican peso. You know, buying the Mexican peso over other currencies it's a huge trade. Um, I can I can only participate in the Euro Max on one of my two uh, FX brokers that I use. I'm not going to badmouth any one of those uh, because as a U.S. trader, but I know a lot of you can trade the Euro Max. I think in in a risk off environment when you're seeing people scurry for the exits regarding banks. You've got debt ceiling debate, you've got risk off, and then you've got the ECB tomorrow, which is could very well be Euro positive. I think the Euro Max is a perfect setup for a long trade, if especially if we get a daily close above the 200 day moving average. I don't even need FIB levels on this. I, I just see it as a triangle setup, close above the 200 day moving average, could actually, actually add to my position above that trend line and be looking for a move back up towards 2040, 2050 on a risk off move. Anyway, Euromax, that's my play of the day. I'll tell you one thing that we can talk about next week because I don't have the exact numbers today, so I'll just be making them up. But I did see what was being priced in for a lot of these um, LATAM currencies in terms of rate cuts over the next two years. Uh, and I'll fill you in next week because, yeah, I think be we're, great. Yeah, we're, 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 we're pricing in well over 200 basis points of cuts in Mexico, Chile, similar. So, yeah, I think 600 basis points of cuts. So this idea of carry, it's worked really well. But now we're in an environment where the markets are saying we we see a vision, and 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 a lot of these EM and LATAM currencies, uh, they're, they're expected to ease back pretty significantly. And I, I just want to quickly say this before my producer sort of goes. Um, it's not necessarily because the world's going into recession. I think the first port of call is they need to bring down rates at some stage once they see the signs of labour market fragility and all these other factors, inflation really sort of trending lower, which isn't happening, and and it may not but they're just going to bring the policy rate back to a more neutral start from a highly restrictive stance. That would be the first port. Whether they actually go into a more accommodative stance is another thing. But LATAM currencies um, are certainly pricing in a large degree of rate cuts, which could change that carry structure going forward. Anyway, one to thanks, uh, factor in. Anyway, so all these people who have stayed on, really appreciate it. Um, hit the like button if you can. We'd appreciate that really a lot as well. And uh, let us know what you're thinking about some of the questions we've asked today, some of the talking points and some of the setups, and also what's on your radar. We'll see you next week for more of The Trade-Off. 